In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello to you. Uh, we're the program that looks at Israel. We look behind the news and we look at the Hebrew roots. And today we have a very special guest in the studio. We have Professor Shalom Paul. Hi, Shalom. Great to have you with us. Great Thank you here, so Martin. much for coming across uh, from the Hebrew University, especially for us. You were there, I guess, this morning. And... Uh, Shalom, Professor Shalom Paul is originally from Philadelphia in the United States. He's a, he is a professor of Bible studies at the Hebrew University. Uh, he specializes in the Bible and ancient Near East. It's cultures, languages, and theologies. He's the chair of the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation and is also chair of the Curriculum Committee of the Bible for the Ministry of Education in Israel. Uh, professor Shalom is an ordained rabbi and is well known, a well-known speaker at universities and synagogues and you really have a, a treat today so do tell your friends uh, to tune into the program. His work has featured uh, in uh, amongst other things in the Jerusalem Post so great to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much for coming across. Um, we uh, first he heard you speaking and you were talking about uh, the importance of understanding the culture of the Bible not just um, reading the text but having a having a wider understanding and and in particular uh regarding in your talk regarding mesopotamia so thank you com for coming in and maybe you can tell us um about uh, i think it was the book of genesis and um the mesopotamia and the, the importance of the background to the to the bible no, thank you martin i'm glad to be here with you and to participate in your program uh, today when we go about studying the bible uh, we see that it is an interdisciplinary study, that in order to understand what, when, how, and why, you have to be very au courant in the area in which the Bible was written. And since you mentioned the book of Genesis, maybe we'll say a few words about that, in particular the beginning, how everything came about. Uh, when we teach and when we study, we have very, very uh, different uh, methods uh, that coalesce together. We are very, very much interested in the theological importance, uh, and we discover that the theological importance is even further enhanced when we are involved with the languages, the cultures uh, of the uh, neighborhood in which the Bible came into being. Its very beginning, of course, starts uh, with an Abraham who was commanded to leave from Ur of Chaldees, which is about 20 miles uh, north of the Persian Gulf, in an area which was at that time called Mesopotamia. And uh, he, since he was his uh, exodus from there to Israel, uh, came about at a very advanced age, which means Abraham came to Israel with all of the knowledge, the customs, the beliefs, that were in Mesopotamia. And so also his wife. They were both uh, born, bred, raised, and educated in Mesopotamia. Because all of this is before the biblical Big Bang, before the uh, onslaught of monotheism. So what we try to do is to get back to the time in which this all took place. And the first thing we hear is this uh, divine command, get out, leave your family, leave your country, leave all that was dear to you, and you set out on the road. And the question is, why? Why did this come this, uh, to breaking the sound burial divine voice come? Uh, anytime someone is commanded to leave, uh, there is a reason for it. And we attempt to discover what was behind, what was the impetus. And what I like to do very much is to say, if you realize the uh, true reason for Abraham's exodus, the first human exodus in history, 
uh, you will understand what takes place in the very first line of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what I attempt to do is to show that the first line of the Bible becomes very understandable when we understand the reason for Abraham's exodus. Try to tie 1-1 one, one of Exodus to 12-1 one of Exodus. And we have to go back then in the time when all of this takes place. So we go back to Mesopotamia, that entire area of Syria, Iraq, uh, in, in, uh, totally encompassed by the two great rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. Are there, are there a lot of records that you're able to access to get the information? There are I literally, without emphasis, hundreds of thousands of clay tablets and thousands, if not tens of thousands, which were written at the time of Abraham and Sarah themselves. And therefore, we can now reconstruct what was happening and where it was happening and why it was happening through these clay cuneiform tablets. Uh, so we learned that Mesopotamia at this time uh, was not a uh, backward uh, country, but was an extremely, extremely developed, sophisticated, mature economy and culture. We know that the, uh, the beginning of math starts there. We know that astronomy, and I know what I say astronomy, not astrology, astronomy starts there. We know that the roots of medicine, the first cranial lobotomy well, it took place there, and that's really using your head. Uh, we have uh, the first historical text, the first geographical text, uh, the magnificent architectural uh, my, uh, buildings, which in the Bible is noted as the Tower of Babel, which in the Mesopotamian background is called the Ziggurat, which is a temple tower leading up to heaven in which a human entered the first floor. The divine was supposedly on the top floor. And we now know that a Ziggurat was not like a pyramid which enhoused the entombed the dead pharaoh, but was a means, it was like one grand cathedral where the humans can have contact with the divine. In other words, at the time of Abraham and Sarah, Mesopotamia was a very, very cultured and sophisticated society and civilization. So why did he leave? And that is what, uh, that is why we are so engaged in this study and it's so challenging. If everything is so good, what was bad? And then when we get to, uh, to pro the most fascinating of all of the areas uh, outside of math and history and geography and poli sci and architecture uh, and medicine, uh, we learn a lot from their literature. And their creation story tells us of how in the beginning there were two bodies of water, a sweet body and a salty body. The sweet body of water was the female goddess and the salty was the male god. They uh, interwatered, so to speak, and there were generations uh, subsequently of gods born. And then, as usual, youth revolts against the mother and father and grandfathers and grandmothers, and there is a rebel with a cause uh, they wanted to be autonomous. And the uh, gods on high, the elder generation, was very perturbed by that. They didn't want to be replaced by the younger ones. Those that the epic tale of Mesopotamia tells us were rollicking and frolicking all day long, so to speak, disturbing the rest and the siesta hours of the parents. So the parents decide to put an end to this and uh, we have ensuing two rounds of battle. I jump to the second round in which the female goddess, whose name was Tiamat, comes with all of her uh, horrendous, hideous, horrible monsters uh, are ready to attack the young ones. And every time she opens her mouth, flames of fire spit forth like in all these fairy tales. 
uh, the younger generation is stymied. They're paralyzed. How can we fight mom and dad with all their advanced technology and warfare? But they turn to their hero, somewhat like uh, David to follow, uh, to fight Goliath. And his name is Marduk. And Mar they say, Marduk, will you take on, the, will you lift the, take the cultures? Will you take on Tiamat? And he said, yes, but on one condition. What's the condition? When I defeat her, you notice he doesn't say if. Youth does not say if. When I defeat her, you will make me numero uno, and I will be the head of the pantheon. They say, Marduk, if you can defeat her, you are our boss. So Marduk comes equipped with his weapons, a, a club and bow and arrow, but that's all for an offensive weapon, warfare. For defensive, he takes with him the four winds, north, south, east, and west. Marduk knows he is fighting a woman who will charge her hordes to attack. And when she says attack and opens her mouth with a attack, he shoves the four winds into her maw. Her belly becomes distended. And then very artfully and skillfully, he says, and he rips and he rends her to pieces uh, and from half the body he makes this, the sky and the other half the land. The world has been created by the body of a split goddess. And then they said, who was it that convinced her to do battle against us? And they said it was her husband. They bring the husband, he is sliced in two and from the blood of of a slain male god, humans are created. So to summarize, according to their study, in this very, very advanced, cultured, sophisticated society, the world was created from the slain body of a goddess, and humans were created from the slain body of a god. They all then surround, all of the younger gods surround Marduk, and they sing him, uh, a beautiful hymn, Hallelujah, Marduk. Marduk, you are our chief God forever and ever. And the curtain comes down. Get out, the divine voice. Why? If you want to learn math, go to the University of Mesopotamia. You want to learn how to be a ziggurat, build a ziggurat, go there. You want medicine, go to the school of medicine, and it'll teach you cranial lobotomies. You want to learn math? Well, the, the, what do you call, the, uh, the, all you have to do is take a course in higher the, algebra, trigonometry. They knew it. Astronomy, they already knew of five of the planets. And that's before Kepler. <laughs> that's before Humboldt. That, that is before any microscope. They already knew that. Look at this advanced society. You want to know, we, you want to learn about the geography? They had maps of the world at that time. History, that you can learn about all of the uh, many campaigns of the Mesopotamian kings all the way over to the Mediterranean. But in one area, and in one area alone, Mesopotamia did not come out, up with a suitable solution. And that, so to speak, is the most important area in our lives. What do I mean when I say God? What do I mean when I say a human being? And what's the relationship between the two of them? Now, with all of that information of Mesopotamia and what was lacking there, we can go to the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In all, all languages, there is a literary device which is called merism, M-E-R-I-S-M which means you take two uh, polar opposites in order to express a totality. We have dozens of them in English. It's as clear to me as, um, as uh, black and white. Uh, the meal was from soup to nuts, yin and yang, uh, uh, alpha to omega, aleph to tav, a to z. Take the two and you are encompassing the whole. So when the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, he is encompassing all by dismerism, by the opposites. 
So if I translate that into simple English, in the beginning, God created the cosmos. In the beginning, God created nature, all of nature. Up until that time, no civilization or culture ever wrote such a thing. Because when we go back to Mesopotamia, the gods are born. In other words, nature creates the gods. Nowhere was it said anywhere or even thought that that is entirely wrong. Nature doesn't create the gods. God created nature. This was the Big Bang. This was the genesis of Genesis. This was the breakthrough. For the first time in, uh, in world history, there is a concept of a God who is above nature. And therefore, the God is not born. The God here, as unlike Mesopotamia, he was not killed, he doesn't die. Uh, we know in Mesopotamian that all of the sacrifices were to uh, to feed the God. Well, God is above nature. <laughs> he doesn't need to eat. And we know uh, that there are many other areas in addition to nature that are totally, uh, I would say, pushed out of any type of purview, of any scope. There is no longer any magic available. You can't, Marduk, when he comes to battle, he put on, he took into his lips a certain uh, plant which would act as a boomerang against Tiamat. But Tiamat's a goddess. He's a god. And yet if you know the correct color, you know the correct formula, you know the correct plant, you can even control the gods. Well, what type of a plant can control the God of Israel? So he's above nature, he's above magic, he's above fate, and he is above time. He, and on the sixth, the seventh day he rested and he declared it holy. A magnificent introduction. Everywhere in the world they believed in holiness in space. We still today, there's a holy temple, a holy crucifix, a holy Kaaba, right in Mecca, holiness in space is implanted in all our minds. But for the first time, there's a whole new additional revolution, holiness in time. Holiness, time can be holy. So a person realized that, he would never say, how can I kill some time, right? This concept of holiness in time, all of this comes about in the first chapter of Genesis, in the first line of Genesis and the chapter ending with the creation of the Sabbath. All of that we would not have known if we did not go back to the roots, go back to Mesopotamia and to see what in the world made Abraham leave. And then when you realize it's because of the theological understanding and the theological motive, the whole thing becomes clear. So 1-1 one, one in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, becomes totally illuminated when we understand the reason for Abraham's leaving Mesopotamia. And, and Abraham would have been brought up on the, um, on, on these that, tales. On that epic. The, on on the that epic, epic yes, yeah. he learned the epic in school like everybody else. That was uh, the training of anybody who went to school. That was their canon at that time, yes. Definitely. And uh, uh, Professor Shalom, one of the one of the interesting things is that uh, a lot of this information you can find now. We can we can research that in the in the tablets, and uh, we can see this information. Um, and uh, how do people react when you because you go around with the with the lectures? And uh, how, how do people react? To I that? must say, um, uh, they are amazed uh, because uh, normally. Uh, they do not hear presentations on the Bible uh, in such a fashion. Uh, as uh, I was discussing a bit before with Natalie, the same thing. Uh, there is a, a standard a traditional uh, readings and interpretations which do not take account of the background. And they don't take account of the background because they are not uh, au courant with the background. In order to do something like this, one has to master many languages. And uh, that's why I always say 
the last thing one does is open the Bible and read it in the Hebrew. He has to know all of the things that will interpret this Hebrew correctly. And that is why a knowledge of Semitic languages is so important. But a knowledge to be rooted in the society to see why you are revolting against the society. And this is just Genesis. Uh, when you're going into Exodus, you have to have the Egyptian background. When you're going into the historical books uh, at the time of Isaiah, you have to have the Assyrian because at the 701, when Sennacherib puts a siege warfare around Jerusalem, we had now have Sennacherib's actual record in Assyrian of this uh, siege warfare. So if you want to know, we, in fact, it's, uh, in, uh, we read it in the Bible, and then we can read it over the walls of Jerusalem in the historical documents of the Assyrian king, which, of course, now is giving us a whole broad vista. When you go to Jeremiah and Nebuchadnezzar, you have to know about the Babylonian background. When you go to the last books of the Bible, Ezra, Nehemiah, the 40 to 66 in Isaiah, mentioned Cyrus, you have to have the Persian background. That's what makes the study of the Bible so challenging, so fascinating, and I must say uh, so interesting because you must master a lot in order to put each book into its correct locus. You have to have the focus on the locus in order to understand really what's happening. And so much of the Bible now is corroborated with outside records that teaching without it uh, would make it a very lame teaching. Now, we, we have a lot of um, uh, uh, modern technology. You know, the computer has transformed uh, the way that we do studying. And is that is that helpful or well, to, to... Definitely, very, very, very helpful. I mean, uh, so many times you'll see people uh, referring to Professor Google. Huh? Uh, and uh, that is so correct. Let's say you just mentioned, I mentioned en passant, Ur of Chaldees, right? So, uh, uh, and we know they are excavated, they excavated. Thank, uh, thank God the museum there wasn't ransacked by Daesh. Uh, but uh, if you want to know about it, so you're going to press Ur of Chaldees because you can't know everything. And when you want to give a background, so you have that available. Uh, and that is correct. But none of this replaces the actual textual reading and interpretation. You have to, because when you're relying on secondary sources, they may be excellent, but nevertheless, to feel comfortable with it and to know that you're doing it expertly, you have to deal with the primary sources. Now, you, you did a, uh, an article for the um, Jerusalem Post, which um, I found very interesting, and it was on the Jerusalem of gold. The, uh, so maybe as, as we come to the end of the program, we can just qu quickly have a look at that. Um. I'd like to have a look at it myself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember being interviewed by the Post. It was, it was an article. It was about the discovery of why. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, yeah but this, this picture they have is all wrong, so that's right. why I don't know. No, yes, that is correct. The, um, the song which has uh, taken the, the hearts of the people, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, uh, everybody sang it, everybody knew the expression, but uh, nobody actually realized what was, his or what was its origin and uh, what was it. And now we know that Jerusalem of Gold was originally the name of a diadem, of a crown, which it was in the form of city walls. If you think of the city walls today of Jerusalem, which of course are much later than the city walls of 2,000 years ago, but it's the same structure. It's like this. Uh, it, we call it in uh, art history today, you would call it a mural, M-U-R-A-L, a mural crown. It's a wall. It's a crown depicting the ramparts and the citadels and the towers of a city. Uh, and now it's very interesting that the, the woman who wrote the song, Nomi Shemer, it became, by the way, so popular that it was the only song in the history of Israel 
that actually was discussed at maybe replacing the national anthem of Hatikva. Uh, in other words, it was that popular. Uh, nevertheless, uh, she wrote the song, which became our second national anthem, and, uh, but she was unaware of what it was itself, Jerusalem of Gold. So one day I, did, I went over to her apartment and explained it to her, uh, where she was very happy to hear. In other words, it's a city wall crown uh, that depicted, uh, because in antiquity, if you were asked to draw a city, how do you draw a city? Today, uh, children in nursery school would draw uh, skyscrapers. Then a city was illustrated and depicted by the walls circumvallating the city. And therefore, you want to draw a city, you draw city walls. And that is originally uh, the, the correct meaning of Jerusalem of gold, city wall crown. That was very interesting. So um, uh, when, a, when somebody comes to study at the Hebrew University, is it it's quite, must be quite a long task because um, to get all the cement, I mean, it seems a bit all or inspiring because they have to learn the Semitic languages. If, if they're and, doing um, a, uh, it's all according if they're going into it in advanced degrees, right? If they're going into uh, an MA and a PhD, yes, that's a very and and that's why I say it is so challenging. Uh, there is nothing uh, like um, there's no there's no dry moment because excavations are going on all the time, and every time a spade hits a ground. Uh, in Israel or in the surrounding uh, uh, countries, something comes up. And therefore, one has to always be ready to reevaluate uh, his, uh, his knowledge and to add to his knowledge. And uh, there, that is what's, that's what I say exciting. There's no end to it. Uh, and therefore, people who are interested in a challenging career but a very difficult one uh, would go in that direction. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to email us, don't forget you can email us at info at inthelastdays.com. Visit the website www.inthelastdays.com. And it's because of your support that we're able to do the program today. And don't forget, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy to use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter, get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.